So I'm like you, you know, there's some preachers that I like, I enjoy more than others, there's some sermons that I enjoy more than others. And over the years, it's been the tradition in North America, every year they have someone in the religious liberty field prepare a sermon to be shared with the church family across North America. And I always think it's good to share those sermons. And I was, I was happy to see <coughs> that the sermon this year is prepared by a man named Alan Reinach. And he has done some of them over the years. And when I saw that, I said, oh, good, because I've, I've always appreciated his sermons. I found them balanced. I found them um, challenging. I found them um, very, um, uh, I don't know what the word that was in my mind just left, but um, I just felt that they give a good perspective of the religious liberty work, and uh, I appreciate them. So I'm going to share his sermon. It's his sermon, not my sermon. It's, um, it's not a great voice. Thank you, Carl, for the prayers. I'll do the best we can here, and hopefully God can help you hear through my voice, <clears throat> as gravelly as it is. Alan Reinick is the executive director of something called the Church State Council, which is the Religious Liberty Educational and Advocacy Arm of the Pacific Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. So he's a licensed attorney. He's an ordained Seventh-day Adventist minister. And he also hosts a nationally syndicated weekly radio broadcast that's devoted to religious liberty issues. He's been doing this for about 25 years. <clears throat> so he's very well, very well experienced and versed in this field. And I, I appreciated this sermon. It's, um, I think it's thought provoking and it, and it provided, I think, some good balanced overview and, and a challenge, certainly a challenge for me. It makes me think, I hope it'll make you think as well. In 1991, <clears throat> the federal authorities conducted a military-style operation on American soil against a minor religious offshoot that had been derided as a cult. The group was isolated. They really had no lines of communication. Their leader was accused of child abuse, even though there had been no formal investigation and no criminal charges had actually been filed. The initial assault on the group's compound was met with return gunfire leading to a standoff that lasted for several weeks. Now, of course, if you, if you have a few years under your belt, you probably know what this is referencing. Eventually, the federal authorities broke the siege with tanks. They set the compound on fire, and really a holocaust ensued. Dozens of people were killed. Many of them were burned to death, including women and children. It was a, it was a very shocking event. I remember when that happened. I think it was... 1993 that happened, or somewhere around there, 1992, something like that. But Mr. Reinhardt suggests that there are some important lessons for Seventh-day Adventist Christians from that tragedy that was suffered by the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas. When the crisis came, those Davidians really had no friends to speak of. They were cut off from the outside world. They really had no venue, no opportunity to communicate their side of the story. Now, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, and our understanding of the Bible, our understanding of Bible prophecies, we expect a crisis to come for us before Christ returns. We read in the Bible that things are going to come to a head. There's a battle between good and evil, and we feel that we're going to be in the mix. And we interpret Revelation 13, where Carl read from our scripture reading. The prophecies in there we interpret to warn of a crisis concerning the enforcement of Sunday as a day of rest and worship and with legal restrictions and monetary sanctions imposed on dissenters. And so the question he asks us to consider is, will we have a voice when the time of crisis comes? Will we have a voice? He suggests that too many Adventists indulge the temptation to speculate on when or how Sunday laws will come about. But you know what? The Bible doesn't tell us. It doesn't. Ellen White doesn't tell us. God hasn't told us. So what does that mean? Maybe that means, I guess, maybe we're not supposed to know. Maybe that's not the most important thing for us to know. Perhaps it would be better and more important to ask ourselves, what are we supposed to do with what we do know? Sometimes it's easy for us to speculate on the things that we can't know instead of working with what we do know. If we know that a crisis will come, how do we prepare for that in the context of religious liberty? 
The Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is vitally important in preparing for the coming crisis. You know, our church has a very good record on this. In the religious liberty realm, when they talk about the players in that, Seventh-day Adventist Church's name always comes up. We have a very long, probably the longest history in this. We have a good record. And it's an important thing. The first and most obvious way is that the church defends the principles of liberty and conscience for all peaceful, peaceful people of faith. Religious persecution, religious freedom, those two things cannot coexist. You cannot have freedom and persecution together. Our success in preserving religious freedom serves, I guess, as an ounce of prevention, maybe a pound of prevention. But the Adventist Religious Liberty Ministry is not really grounded in our beliefs about last day events. I thought that was interesting. It's not really about last day events, but he suggests really our religious liberty ministry is much more founded, our basis for it is the core gospel principles. It's really a gospel issue more than a last day, how do we protect ourselves issue. It really comes to the core of what the gospel is about. Think about it, from the beginning, God gave humanity freedom. You look back at the opening book in the Bible and we have that scene that we can read about there in the Garden of Eden. Tree of knowledge of good and evil, the most dangerous spot on planet Earth at that time. The most dangerous place ever. Now, today we're pretty good at protecting dangerous places, right? Um, I remember he, he listened to him do the sermon. He, he said lawyers have had a lot of influence in that. But we protect dangerous places because we don't want to get sued. We put guardrails on winding mountain roads and we put barbed wire fences to keep children away from train tracks and dangerous places. We do all kinds of things to try to keep people safe and not sue us. But you read the book of Genesis, do you see any barbed wire fence around the tree of good, knowledge of good and evil? Nothing there. Why not? How come there's no big sign, you know, a nice big circle with a line through it? You know, the, the, the symbol for, for not, you know, like, why isn't there a big sign there, a flashing sign, do not eat, do not eat? Why didn't God put a reminder sign? Why didn't he put a fence around the tree? It's not as though he gave Adam and Eve no warning or no instruction. He, he actually taught them not to eat, and that should have been enough, right? But he took no measures beyond that, it seems, to prevent them from eating. Adam and Eve were free to eat, and if they chose to do so, they were still free to do so, even though the consequences would be so destructive. So there's a very simple principle he suggests at play here, and that is the principle of love. It, it boils down to what it says in 1 John 4, 8, that God is love. Desire of Ages, page 22, it says, Love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. <clears throat> so God could not command Adam and Eve to love and trust him. He couldn't restrain their free choice. Maybe sometimes we wish that he had, right? What if God had just fixed those two? And if you're a parent, there may no doubt have been times when you have been perhaps tempted to pray that God would fix your kids. You know, just rearrange the brain chemistry a little bit, rewire them, fix them from the inside out, make them perfectly happy, holy, healthy, obedient little cherubs. Have you ever wished for that? Hey, yes, that was heartfelt. Even if you're not a parent, you might have been tempted at some time, maybe in, in a time of discouragement, maybe to say that prayer for yourself. You just said, man, God, I wish you could just redo me. And, and I guess, yeah, the omnipotent God, he could have done that. He could have just wiped Adam and Eve's memory bank clean and started over, kind of a do-over, re rewire them. But that wouldn't work with love. Love cannot be coerced, because God is love. God gives us freedom, then in a sense, because he has to. He has to because it's his nature, it's his character to permit us to love him and also to permit us to rebel against him. He cannot, in fact, he will not force us. And that's why Jesus had to die on the cross. So did God know what was gonna happen when he created Adam and Eve? Did he know there was gonna be some problems? Yeah, he knew that. That's, I think, why Revelation 13 refers to him as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 
the decision that Jesus would become our savior, our atoning sacrifice, that he would be the one to deliver us from the, the power and the penalty of sin. That decision was made even before Adam and Eve ever sinned or even thought about sinning. So from that perspective, religious liberty is an essential component then of the gospel itself. It's not some sideline of interest that we're involved in. It, it really ties into the heart of what Christianity is about. Jesus paid the highest price on account of our freedom. So when we as a church work to protect and defend religious freedom, then in essence we become like the gospel in shoes. We defend religious freedom not just for ourselves, but we defend it for everyone, for the people that don't believe as we believe, the people that maybe even hate what we believe, for everyone. And we have been doing that as an organized church in an organized fashion ever since we first organized something called the International Religious Liberty Association, and that was back in 1893. We have a very, probably the longest history in this work. Last year, the IRLA, as it's known, conducted its eighth World Congress, and people came to Florida from 65 different nations, scholars and activists and government officials and pastors and, and church members, and they came together to work on creating a world where people of different faiths can live together in peace and mutual respect. It's a worthy cause. And is that work needed? Yeah, it's probably needed now more than ever. You know, 70 years ago after the Holocaust, world leaders came together and they drafted something called a Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Have you ever heard of that? Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The effort was led by who was at that time the first lady of the United States, president's wife, Eleanor Roosevelt. And every nation that has joined the United Nations since that, which is pretty well almost all of the nations, they have officially signed on to that universal declaration, which means that human rights have now become enshrined in international law and in diplomacy. So isn't that good? When dictators or terrorists violate human rights, they know that they face the wrath of the international community. Isn't it nice to have that in place? United Nations, human rights, everything's good in our world. Yeah. Article 18 of the Universal Declaration protects liberty of conscience, religion, and belief. That's what the world community has said, that's what should happen. At least that's what we've said should happen. But despite some of the amazing progress that has happened on human rights, <coughs> ironically, religious freedom has actually deteriorated around the world. It's not better. It's actually worse. In fact, today, 75% or more, three quarters or more of the global population live in nations with little or no religious freedom. If you spent your whole life in North America, like I have, you kind of probably take it for granted, you know, the freedoms that we enjoy. You might think that that's normal. It's not normal around the world. I don't even know how long it's going to be normal here in Canada, because I see things changing in ways I haven't seen before in my life. It's kind of disturbing. But what we have here is so much better than what most people have. They do not have the freedom to choose. Many in those nations, yeah, they can remain a part of the majority religion, but if they should make the choice to convert to another faith, they face severe consequences. And so the Adventist work of protecting and defending religious freedom, it's needed. It's needed now more than ever. It's not something that's all taken care of. <clears throat> Mr. Reinach suggests that the global situation implicates another value of religious freedom, and that is the Great Commission. It's interesting to see how that can tie in with this. You know, Jesus, you know the Great Commission, Matthew 28, right? Jesus taught his disciples to go out into all the world for a witness, teach, and baptize, right? We've tried to do that. Adventists have tried to do that. We've tried to go around the world, preach the gospel, raise up churches. We've done so in more than 200 different countries. We're really ahead of a lot of other Christian groups in that. Praise God for what's being done. But there are countries where it's still very difficult to preach. It's almost impossible to have a church there. In fact, you might have heard just last year, <clears throat> Russia did something unexpected. The country of Russia banned the Jehovah's Witnesses. 
seized all their bank accounts, shut down their churches, just decided, boom, you're done, we're taking all your stuff. Kind of scary. No, but it's just them. No, it's not just them. Frankly, some of the Adventist leaders there fear that they may soon suffer the same fate. So let's return to the lessons of Waco then, for this brings us to the public affairs aspect of the religious liberty ministry. Religious minorities, and we need to make no mistake about it, we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we are a minority. We really are. We, um, you know, we have these millions of people around the world and we're all over the world, but on the global stage, we are small fries. We're a small group. We're, we're, we're not big compared to many other things in the world. We are a minority. And that means that we need to work in coalition with others to protect and defend religious freedom. We don't have the numbers, we don't have the power, we don't have the money to succeed on our own. We can't carry this whole thing on our own. We're just gonna do it all by ourselves because we're the only ones we trust. It's too big. We're too small and it's too big. So Mr. Reinach, who's been working on this for a long time, says that in our organized ministry, we do tend to collaborate with many other groups both on the liberal side of things and the conservative side of things. I'm not talking about Canadian, federal, and provincial parties, but, but on a broader scale than that. And interfaith work has been compared to Sandlot baseball. He said every week we pick up teams. One week on one issue, maybe where we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians in the religious liberty work stand, maybe we're kind of more standing sort of on the side with the conservatives. Then next week, next month, next year, on another issue, Maybe we're really more on the side of the liberals, because it really depends on the issue at hand. In a way, we maybe sometimes don't really fit in with anybody, because perhaps we should have a broader view. <clears throat> but he suggests that while that happens with our church on a, on a, on a broad scale organizational level, he issues a concern that maybe at the local church level, maybe at the community level, it's not the case. Maybe our churches are not sufficiently engaged with the community. Maybe we're not building those bridges of friendship and establishing lines of communication in our local communities. Maybe we're not doing that often enough. It's an interesting and thought-provoking thing to think about. He suggests that one lesson from Waco is this, when the final crisis comes, will the leaders in our community have their doors open? Will they welcome Adventists to come and sit down face to face and share their concerns? Will they even know that we exist? Do we have any friendships? Do we have any basis of respect in our communities? Or do we kind of live in a little bubble, isolated, all alone by ourselves? He suggests that if so, we have perhaps set ourselves up in setting ourselves apart for persecution. And so he suggests that we need to establish the best friendships, the best lines of communication that we can do so in our own local community now. This is the time to do it. This is the time when there is relative peace and security. During a crisis, it's really hard to like make friends and build bridges. You got other things to worry about. And so he challenges us with the thought that that requires an attitude adjustment on our part, a paradigm shift even. Because as Adventist people, sometimes we can be so preoccupied with our understanding of the last day events that we even sometimes allow that to poison our relationships. We become suspicious and afraid of everybody. And we can start so that we look at everybody as a potential threat. They might, they might be against us. It's true, they might, but they're not right now. And he, he's saying, instead of looking at people as a potential threat, the gospel calls us instead to look at people as souls for whom Christ died. That's what we're called to do. Ephesians 2. Paul writes that Christ's death demolished the wall that separated Jew and Gentile. But sometimes we as Adventists, we've, we've built another wall. We've built our own wall, separating us from everyone else. We've got to be safe from everyone. We have precious truth, and we do. I don't want to be a part of any other church. Because I believe this movement has a, has a, a perspective and an understanding on, on prophecy and Bible truth and a whole picture of relationship with God that I don't see anywhere else. And that doesn't mean the others are less than us, but we have, a, 
We have a calling from God as a movement of people. We're not, I don't think we're just another church. We have precious truth. But what do we do with that truth? Do we, do we, do we fortify ourselves in isolation? He says this truth should make us all the more eager to build bridges of friendship with others so that we can enhance those opportunities to share that truth. Having truth shouldn't make us stay away from everyone. It should make us reach out to everyone. Instead, too often the truth creates barriers, and we treat those not of our church as outsiders. We have a good word for them, right? What do we call them? Non-Adventists. Mr. Reinhardt suggests, how would you like to be called a non? A non-anything. Maybe it's not the best terminology. So he suggests a fresh look at some key scriptures. First of all, Matthew chapter 5, <clears throat> verses 43 to 48, where Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Don't even the tax collectors do so? It's like the tax collectors are the lowest you can get, right? And then it says, therefore, Jesus says, therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, historically for us, the Seventh-day Adventist Christians, if we look back in some of our history, it seems that our concept of perfection probably too often emphasized performance as opposed to attitude. But here, if we look at what Jesus is saying, he clearly establishes that our perfection, or another way to say that, our completion, is really a function of our compassion. Our love for the ones who are the most difficult to love, which would be even our enemies. Does anyone here have any enemies? Two whole congregations, first service and second service, and I'm the only person with enemies. You people are so far ahead of me. <clears throat> Good for you. Hypothetically, if you had an enemy, do you think you would love them? I know it's hard for you to imagine because you don't have any. Do you think you would love them? I mean, come on, is that possible? Can you even love them? Can you love your enemy? Is Jesus asking the impossible? And perhaps the answer is found in Romans 5.8. It says, while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. He's shown the way. I don't think really, frankly, most or probably any of us have the ability to love our enemies. That's just not normal human behavior. But only the love of Christ in our hearts can do that. With Christ, we can Famed German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer was writing about <clears throat> that verse in Revelation 3. You know, Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. <coughs> and he asked the question, Who is this Jesus that's knocking at the door of our hearts? And even in this, it's interesting, we can see religious liberty. You know, we see Jesus here. Look at how, I mean, we're in a world right now where like every week, every day almost, there's a report of yet another person, some man, who has used his position and authority to abuse and manipulate and exploit some woman, right? I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's almost endless. And we get just a little sense of how much of this goes on in our world. But look at Jesus here. Is Jesus like that? He's a gentleman. He is patiently, persistently knocking. He's not forcing his way in. He's not forcing anybody to do anything. He won't enter your life unless you invite him in, unless you're willing. And I hope you are willing to invite Jesus into your life. And if you're sitting here today and you've never done that, you've never invited Jesus into your life, today can be the day you do that. Really. It's as simple as simply in your mind saying to God, Jesus, I open my life to you. You may not understand what all that means. You can do that right now. You don't have to talk to me. You don't have to talk to a pastor. I mean, you can, but it's not a requirement. You can invite him in right now. 
And if you do, it's the best decision I believe you'll ever make. So back to Bonhoeffer's question. <coughs> Who is this Jesus knocking? He answered the question by going, referring to Matthew 25. So maybe access your Bible if you've got one. It might be getting lonely. Matthew chapter 25. And let's look at 35 to 40. Who is this Jesus? He's knocking at our door. Matthew 25, beginning at verse 35. <clears throat> it says, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, like, what? Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothing and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. <clears throat> so who are the least of these, my brethren? I don't think really Jesus calls anybody least, does he? It doesn't sound like Jesus. He doesn't demean anyone. He doesn't put anybody down. He doesn't categorize people. He doesn't see other people as beneath him. I think it's us that do that. That's what we tend to do. Jesus calls them the least probably for our benefit because we can understand that because we all have that tendency as humans to see someone else as somehow lesser than ourselves, somehow beneath us, somehow lower class, lower something. We just have that tendency to find a way to always look down on the other guy, the other girl, and somehow see ourselves better. And none of us are immune to that because we all have biases. Make no mistake, in the new covenant, God promises to give us a new heart and a new spirit. And so Jesus here defines that new heart and that new spirit in terms of our compassion for the ones who are naked and sick and in prison. And Jesus tells us very plainly that we need to see Jesus in the most unlikely people, at least the ones who seem unlikely to us. This is a challenging thought. It's challenging for me because I see some folks and it's not natural for me to see Jesus in them. It requires an attitude adjustment on the part of the entire church. It means abandoning any vestige of this kind of us versus them mentality. <clears throat> Instead of separating ourselves, building walls, we're called to build bridges. Instead of seeing others for how they differ from us, whether it's in belief or race or national origin or whatever, it's learning to see Jesus in them. I think that's a learned behavior. And the more we learn to see Jesus in them, I thought this was a profound statement that he made. The more we learn to see Jesus in them, the easier it will be for them to see Jesus in us. That made me think. And then he took it a step further. He said, it may be that others will be unable to see Jesus in us until we learn to see Jesus in them. You can do some reflection on that. So he speaks a little bit from a United States perspective about living in a polarized nation. And I think it's a little bit different for us in Canada. I think there's some similarities, there's some differences. I think you have the, the kind of religious right conservative side in Canada and the, the kind of secular left liberal side as well, but I think the balance is much different. I think in Canada the, the kind of conservative religious right side has become a, a much smaller component. <clears throat> so maybe it seems like the battle doesn't wage quite in the same way here as it does in the States, but it's still there. <clears throat> So speaking of his nation, he says, liberals and conservatives hate each other. We don't talk to each other. We're engaged in a culture war fight to the finish. And Adventists have eagerly joined these culture wars, even though that's not our battle. And I wonder about us in Canada, you know, in a society that is increasingly secular, increasingly liberal from the perspective of values and morals. I wonder how prone we are to just buy into that more and more. I know we are because I hear what people in the church say. And sometimes I'm like, what? How do we say that as a Christian? But we are so inclined to jump on board, right? 
But it's interesting who we are as Seventh-day Adventist Christians if we keep this in perspective. We're really neither the secular left nor the religious right. We don't really fully identify with either side. We shouldn't. I think he's, he put it that um, we're, in the, we're in the lonely middle. That's where we should be. Because our aim should be, and what we want it to be, is to protect the liberty of conscience and religion of everyone, believers and unbelievers alike. And frankly, in our society in North America, that's getting less and less. You don't hear too much of that. Liberal and conservative protagonists in the culture wars, they want to protect their own rights, not the rights of others. There's not so many people anymore saying, you know what, we all should have our freedoms protected. And that's where we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians can be a balance. But it's easy to get caught up in the rhetoric and in the fight. And an interesting thing that he pointed out, he said, in that kind of a climate, that, that uh, battle, and maybe it's even more so the case for us in Canada. Oh, I know it's late. I'm, all, I'm really pretty close to done, so be of courage. <clears throat> maybe this is even a bigger issue for us in Canada. Because he, he raises the question in, in this climate of kind of the right and the left, the conservative liberal, where nobody seems to care about anybody else's rights, except their own. He asked the question, do unchurched secular people have then a positive image of Jesus? And I think it's a bigger deal for us because much more of our society is the secular non-believer. So do they associate Jesus with hatred and bigotry? Now that may not be an, a fair or appropriate uh, analysis that they take, but it is a reality. A lot of people who are not in the Christian realm, they don't really often have great thoughts about Christians. So it's not accusing conservatives of being full of hate and bigotry, because there's plenty of bigotry on both sides. Moral equivalence is appropriate. Liberals and conservatives are capable of equal doses of intolerance. But what we need to think about is if our, if our deal is to share the gospel message with secular folks, are they getting a fair shot at seeing Jesus by the way Christians react to things done wrong to us and even things done wrong to them? Preaching alone isn't going to change that. They're not going to come listen to these sermons. They frankly are not going to come to an evangelistic series of meetings the way we've traditionally done that. What that means is if we want to have the opportunity to give them a true picture of Jesus and the gospel, it puts a lot of weight on our personal shoulders. It becomes a personal thing. It means becoming the hands and the feet and the ears and the eyes and the heart of Jesus in our community. <coughs> it means going out into our world, into our community, not just to teach things, but to live the love of Christ and serving our community. Going out and seeing those we regard as least in our own town, our own neighborhood, our own big city here, and actually choosing to see them as Jesus and treat them as Jesus. It's hard to do, it's not easy for me to do. Give them a cup of cold water, feed them, clothe them, love them as we would Jesus. He's suggesting if we wanna have any hope of sharing the gospel with them, it's not gonna be by entrenching ourselves in our rights. It's trying to build bridges. And he said that in short represents both the public affairs and community services ministries of the Adventist Church. If our church is to take this attitude adjustment seriously, then it comes back to learning the first lesson of Waco, establishing the best lines of communication that we can now before a time of crisis with the leaders in our community, making sure that when a crisis comes, hopefully the doors will at least be open to us because they'll know us as loving and lovable Christians, persons of faith and integrity, and maybe that will afford us the opportunity to have our concerns heard. We know eventually it'll come to a head. But in the meantime, build bridges of friendship, seek new ways to serve our community, pray and work to become the hands and feet and heart and soul of Jesus in serving our community. He suggests that that approach to public affairs, it's not just a legal thing for in court, is the best way to preserve religious liberty, but it's also essential to our great commission to bring the knowledge of Jesus to every kindred, tongue, people in this hour of God's judgment. It's 106. I have some stuff here about Canada, but I'm not going to um, <clears throat> go through all that because I might be alone by the time I'm done. 
But I will tell you this, if you want to, if you want to um, kind of keep up with some of the, the honestly shocking things that are happening in Canada, um, a good place to do that is, is to hook up with Barry Bussey's uh, blog. He really does a good job of updating that and uh, really keeps things up to date. You can just punch in Barry Bussey uh, online and, and get connected with some of the information. You know, we, I hear, um, I don't know, I've become quite disillusioned with all of government parties, but, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, we hear like, well, the government we have now is really good for immigrants. And maybe so, maybe so. But a government that says we're going to go and try to abort and make sure you don't have any more babies in your country so we don't need to have you as immigrants anymore. And some of the... Some of the, like I've never seen, flagrant um, stabs at Christian freedom that our government is taking, it shocks me. And I wonder, what kind of country will this be to immigrate if things continue for a while? So it's a challenging thing to think about. Here in Ontario, <clears throat> 2012, Globe and Mail, the, um, the leaders of the Ontario Bar, the Law Society of Upper Canada, Ontario's lawyers. <clears throat> they were in crisis. And these are their own leaders saying our whole profession is in crisis. We have parental leave program problems. We're losing female lawyers to our industry. Our whole thing is in a mess. They're saying that it's hard to get good people to article. Uh, they're saying judges are finding more and more lawyers are appearing before them that basically have no legal skills. Um, they're unable to argue a case. They're unable to question a witness. They're unable to calculate judgments. They don't know how to pursue a case. The problem is profound. This is what they're saying about themselves. So how interesting <clears throat> that the legal profession, by its own expression, is struggling how interesting to look at Trinity Western University, this university, Christian University in British Columbia, applies to have a law school, and everything's in place, but the whole legal establishment in Canada fought, fought, fought against that. It went through all the levels of court. Finally, they said, no, there's, there's no good reason for this school not to have a law school. So they finally were granted accreditation for a law school. So then the Law Society of Canada, or whatever it's called, says, well, let's... Um, Let's ask all the provincial uh, law societies to ban all of their graduates. And British Columbia, Nova Scotia, and Ontario went after that. British Columbia lost. They lost in the Court of Appeal, the Supreme Court for the province. And just last month, they went to the Supreme Court of Canada. Nova Scotia lost. They lost in the appeal, and they decided not to go further. But here in Ontario, good old Ontario, here we are, center of the universe, it was the opposite. Trinity Western lost, and they lost again. And the Supreme Court was inter interesting. Last month, they're hearing BC saying, overturn it so that we can shut these guys down. And they're hearing Trinity Western saying, please overturn it so we can, serve, we can work in Ontario. It's going to be very interesting how that plays out. But how interesting that a, a profession that's, by their own admission, in crisis, is spending an amazing amount of time and money to prevent someone who graduates from an accredited law school in a Christian university from ever serving in this province simply because, as a student of that university, takes a, signs a covenant that they will follow their moral convictions and only be involved in heterosexual activity with a married partner. And that is Ontario's concern that we're at the Supreme Court to fight against. If you're in this much crisis, is that your biggest enemy? What I'm trying to say to you, just give a hint, is that I think things are changing. I think things are changing in our society. And I've, I've lived my whole life in North America, and I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with the accommodations that we've had. But it's very interesting to see what's happening. I'm not sure it's going to stay like this. I hope it can, but it's very interesting. So we need... We need to be clear in our own minds where we stand, what we do, what we do as a church, what we do as individuals, and again, try to build bridges. Thank you for your extended 
patience. 